On this episode of Real Truth, we are going to address cancel culture. This has become a prevalent trend in our culture, so how should Christians respond to it? Should we get involved in canceling others? Also, we take a look at live streaming church services. Now that the pandemic is winding down and restrictions are being eased, many churches are considering ending their live streams. Should we discontinue live streaming? Or are there reasons we should continue? Let's consider the truth about all of that up next. Hello, and thanks for watching Real Truth. Our first segment for today is another real take. The segment that gives a biblical take on cultural opinions, events, and news. I'm sure you know about cancel culture. Somebody did or said something that was perceived as offensive or controversial, and they got canceled for it. This is sadly a growing trend in our society in the name of so-called accountability. Maybe they are racist. Maybe they have a different opinion about the vaccines. Maybe they disagree over other gender and education. Or maybe they even said something 20 years ago that somebody uncovered and now doesn't like. Whatever it is, it is usually based on the desire to control others and make them socially acceptable and is based on subjective truth rather than truth in the biblical sense. When truth is based on preference and tolerance is king, the intolerant are seen as a danger to society and must be silenced. Now, if someone has committed sexual abuse, financial crimes, or other corrupt and illegal behavior, they should be held accountable for their actions. However, cancel culture goes far beyond that. Many people have recently tried to cancel Joe Rogan due to the recent alleged misinformation and previous racial slurs that he has shared on his podcast. Even though he has apologized for the racial slurs that were only a part of quotes that he read, his cancellation is still pursued. Or consider Whoopi Goldberg, and many people now want canceled due to the comments she made about the Holocaust that I talked about last week. You could easily find many more examples of people who have been canceled. It seems like no one is safe from being canceled. It can affect politics, sports, entertainment, or business, people's jobs, families, reputations, and really their entire lives have been ruined as a result of being canceled. In many ways, it really has gone too far. The idea of canceling others can become a slippery slope because it is based on such subjective opinions. There are always going to be people who disagree, so there's no sense in canceling everyone over something that is often petty. As Christians, there are several reasons that we should avoid being caught up in this trend, especially considering how it could damage our witness. Really, this practice is unbiblical and goes against how we should act as Christians. So, what is the real take? Christians need to be people of the truth. Most of the time, when people are canceled, it is not necessarily based on the truth. Social norms and what pleases the culture is not necessarily what pleases God. People, especially unbelievers, do not judge according to God's standards. They judge according to their own, which are usually subjective. Those who cancel others oftentimes don't care about the truth and only seek vengeance. 
This then becomes a form of vigilantism. It doesn't matter if the person changes or repents. They only care that they pay for their wrongdoings. They don't want to forgive these people, they just want to hurt. And slander them enough so they are silenced and removed from the public eye. They can even become violent toward the cancelled and feel justified in their hatred toward them. Ultimately, they find the cancelled as unforgivable and beyond the point of redemption so much so that their cancellation can become permanent. When you consider these intentions and all of the ungodly attitudes contained in cancel culture, it becomes clear that Christians should have nothing to do with this type of accountability. There are certainly situations where Christians should stand up for what is right, oppose what is wrong, and even keep people accountable, but it should be done with the spirit of love, gentleness, forgiveness, and the hope for redemption and reconciliation. Those who attempt to cancel others often act rashly, which is also not how Christians should behave. The Bible tells us to love our enemies, not hate and slander them, as much as it might seem to us like they deserve it. Just look at Luke 6, verses 27 to 28. But I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you. Does that sound like cancel culture? We should not slander others, instead we should speak with grace and the truth of the gospel. Look also at Colossians 4, 6. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. The Bible also says in Ephesians 4, verse 15, Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way in the hand who is the head, into Christ. You see, complaints, especially in the church, should not be handled by canceling the other party. Instead, we should bear with them and forgive them. The world wants to label the canceled as unforgivable. But don't forget that God forgave you and loved you while you were still a sinner. The Bible warns that if you withhold forgiveness, God will not forgive you. We see these truths clearly in verses like Romans 5.8. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Also look at Matthew 6, 14-15. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your Heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. It is not our job to determine whether someone is irredeemable. That is left up to God to judge. We see this clearly in Luke 6, 37. Judge not, and you will not be judged. Condemn not, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. We should take no part in condemning others. We can condemn the ungodly actions they take and warn people that their sins deserve punishment, but God can redeem anyone, even the worst of all criminals, if he so chooses. We are supposed to seek to restore believers should they be caught in sin. But only God can reconcile lost sinners even though He does want us to be messengers of the reconciling message of the Gospel. I also want to look at Galatians 6 verse 1. It says, Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in the spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourselves, lest you too be tempted. Christians are to be characterized by their love 
and feed people of peace. <laughs> Scripture makes that clear in verses like John 4, 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Also look at Hebrews 12, 14. Strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Those clearly show that Christians should be defined by love and peace. One thing I think we really must realize is that everyone has sinned and that people will make mistakes. It's made clear in Romans 3.23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. It is not a very good witness if we just cancel everyone who sins. Instead, we should follow the Lord, love everyone, pray for the salvation of the lost, and share the message of the gospel in the hopes that some will be saved. I think that getting involved in cancel culture only damages our witness, and I don't really see any benefit. There are more godly and beneficial ways to resolve conflict than canceling others. Now it's time for our second segment, Real Tech. In this Real Tech, I want to focus on live streaming church services, something that many churches began when they could not have in-person services during the pandemic. A recent article from Religion News Service titled Streaming Online has been a boon for churches, a God Central Isolated, it pointed out many of the benefits of this transition. It said that a report on churches and technology during the pandemic found that by offering online services, Churches were able to expand their reach, often connecting with people outside the community or reconnecting with former members who had moved away. Even small congregations that had once struggled to reach outside the walls of their church were able to expand their reach, according to when pastors put on the tech hat. A report from the Tech in Churches Research Project Led by Heidi Campbell, Professor of Communication at Texas A&M University. The article continues, with the shift online, churches were shocked to discover the ways that an online service can become a wide-reaching net to whoever is interested in, turn in tuning in or watching. According to researchers, one pastor described this widening reach and shift as shut-ins being no longer shut out. This shows that there are many advantages to live streaming. It is great that it has helped churches expand their reach and given people who are maybe less interested in attending church a way to hear the gospel. In some cases, live streaming has even increased in-person church attendance now that restrictions are reduced, this has been beneficial for those with health concerns so they could avoid the additional risk associated with getting COVID-19. This also finally gave people with disabilities who found it difficult to attend church accommodations that they might not have had before the pandemic. These benefits have led many churches to continue live streaming their services. However, many churches are now reconsidering due to many of the disadvantages of live streaming. Now that much of the risk of the pandemic has passed, many do not find it as necessary because it is better to gather in person anyway. Church leaders are concerned by the fact that many have gotten out of the habit of attending church as they got used to sleeping in and spending time with their families. Some people have even replaced in-person services with online services. 
Some pastors and volunteers are worn out by the extra effort it takes to live stream. Because it is a challenge to keep up, and many feel that it has hurt the fellowship in the church, they don't think it is worth it anymore. I do think that some of these concerns are valid. However, I don't think some of the benefits can be overlooked even with these dangers. Yes, Christians need to understand that if they have the ability, they should attend church in person. Hebrews 10.25 makes that clear. Not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Even though some are no longer attending like they used to, it is possible that some of them never believed in the first place. It is possible that there are unbelievers in the church, and this could have weeded them out. Look at 1 John 2, 19. They were not from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went all out that might be complained that they all are not of us. Now this verse was mainly speaking about false teachers who left the church. But there are other verses that make it clear that there are unbelievers in the church too. And if they leave, it might just be a sign that they were never really of us. That they were never really believers in Christ. So I think that's something we do need to keep in mind for those who are no longer attending. Live streaming continues to be essential for those with health concerns, the elderly, and the disabled. So what is the balance? Do we stop and make it easy on the leadership? Do we stop so there are no longer concerns over those who have replaced in-person services with online services and other activities? Or do we do the difficult thing and ensure that the at-risk and disabled communities continue to have the ability to participate in church? As a disabled person myself, I don't think any disabled or at-risk person should be excluded from participating in the body of Christ. Another religion news source article, Quitting Online Church, is abandoning the one for the 99, it recently shared these findings. According to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, 26% of adults are disabled. One in 10 adults age 18 and older, and double that for those 65 and older, have a disability that impacts one or more areas of functioning enough to require support from others. Based on this data alone, it is easy to see why it is so important to make provisions to include the disabled now that live streaming is more prevalent. Honestly, most churches haven't been doing enough in accommodating the disabled to begin with, so this is a huge step in the right direction. The technology is there and is now implemented more than ever before. Now is the time to act and to make sure that we are doing all that we can to minister to the disabled the needy, and the shut-ins. But what does the Bible say that can help us answer these questions? Let's take a look. Is live streaming difficult? Look, well, of course it is, and I can speak from experience. But is there ever a good excuse not to do something just because it is difficult? Look at Galatians 6 verse 9, and let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap, if we do not give up. Look also at Colossians 3.23. Whatever you do, work heartily, as for the Lord, and not for men. 
We should not grow weary or give up in doing good. We are working for the Lord and not for men anyway. I don't think God wants us to marginalize the disabled just because it is difficult to keep them included. God can give those serving the strength they need to continue offering live streaming even if they get worn out. Isaiah 40 verse 31 says this, But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. God cares for the marginalized and the needy. He did not even turn children away when the disciples thought they were being a nuisance. He showed us that children, the poor, the needy, and the shut-ins should be served. Just look at Mark 10, verses 13 through 14. And they were bringing children to him that he might touch them. And the disciples rebuked them. But when Jesus saw it, he was indignant and said to them, Let the children come to me. Do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. The Gospel of Matthew 25, verse 40. And the king will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. When we serve the least of these, we need to remember that it is like we are serving the Lord. In addition to the example of Jesus, other portions of scripture make it clear that we need to care for people like the disabled. Just consider Psalm 82 verses 3 through 4. Give justice to the weak and the fatherless. Maintain the right of the afflicted and the destitute. Rescue the weak and the needy. Deliver them from the hand of the wicked. Like also Acts 20 verse 35. In all things I have shown you that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus. Now he himself said, It is more blessed to give than to receive. How can we help the weak and the needy if we do not give them the time and effort? This is just another way to love your neighbor as yourself, as we are commanded to do in Galatians 5.14. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Philippians 2 verses 3 through 4 says, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others as more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Because we are created in the image of God, all life has value, including that of the disabled. We don't just stop looking to the interests of others when it is difficult. We need to consider all the disabled and others who are shut in as more significant than ourselves. It is essential that we do all that we can to include all Christians in fellowship and corporate worship. Yes, there are risks involved to live streaming. Yes, it is important to be together in person. Yes, live streaming is difficult. But none of these are valid excuses to stop live streaming. I think the advantages far outweigh the disadvantages. Live streaming is not a replacement for church, nor should it be, but it might be the only way some people can be involved in church. I hope that this video has encouraged you in your walk with the Lord. Let's be different from the world by refusing to participate in this ungodly cancel culture and by caring for those who need it the most. Thanks for watching this video. Please like this video subscribe to the channel, and hit that bell icon to receive notifications.
It also helps out if you share this video. Be sure to leave a comment if you have any suggestions and follow us on social media. Until next time, walk in the truth.